Good evening. Uh, happy Tuesday and thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Claire O'Keefe and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's virtual event with Julian E. Zalazar discussing his new book, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the New Republican Party. He is joined in conversation by Rick Perlstein. Uh, through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community uh, during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events right here on Zoom. And as always, our event schedule appears on our website, which is harvard.com slash events. Uh, and you can also sign up there for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. Uh, this evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, you can go to the Q&A button right down in the bottom corner of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Uh, if you'd like to buy a copy of Burning Down the House, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase and I'll drop that link after I do my intro. Um, and all sales to this link support the Harvard Bookstore. So thank you, especially during this difficult time for community, for community spaces like your local bookstore. Um, there will also be a link for a donation in the chat, if you'd like to give an additional give additional support to Harvard Bookstore, your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual events uh, event author series possible. And now more than ever, support the future of our landmark independent bookstore. Uh, so thank you for tuning in in support of authors and the incredible staff of Harvard Bookstore. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced during virtual gatherings in these last few weeks, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Uh, and now I'm happy to introduce tonight's speakers. Julian E. Zelzer is a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. He has written and edited nearly a dozen books, including Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. He has published over 700 op-eds along with his weekly column to CNN. And he has received fellowships from the Brookings Institution, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, and New America. He is joined in conversation by Rick Perlstein, who is the author of The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. He is a former chief national correspondent for The Village Voice and former online columnist for The New Republic and Rolling Stone. Tonight, they'll be discussing Julian's latest book, Burning Down the House. It tells the story of how Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, set the Republican Party on the path to become what it is today. Library Journal calls it a compelling work of political history. Zelzer's accessible study of political behavior and leadership directly relates to today's tumultuous political scene. Anyone interested in American politics will devour this book. And on that note of praise, I will let our authors tell us some more. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Rick Perlstein. I'm also a historian and an old friend of Julian's. Uh, I have nine of his books on my shelf, uh, more than anyone else, more than Philip Roth, more than, more than Anton Chekhov. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I used to have 10. I don't know what happened to the one on Clinton. I think I might have loaned it to a neighbor and it sort of disappeared. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I specialize in the history of the right. So um we kind of share this particular intellectual adventure and many others julian is a towering figure in the history uh the, history, the writing of history of american politics so um i think most people are uh, most familiar either uh when it comes to uh, their own memories or what they might have heard about if they're a little younger uh with newt gingrich's um election as speaker of the house in 1995 after uh, this epic making uh, election in 1994 in which uh, uh, the Republican so-called revolutionaries uh, took over Congress for the first time uh, since uh, the 1930s, took over the House of Representatives for the first time from the 1930s. You're not writing about that. You chose a different uh, event to focus on in Newt Gingrich's career as the kind of sinosure of uh, the movement we're in now. So what's that? Uh, story you tell and, and why did you choose to tell this particular one? Well, I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Rick, uh, for joining us and thanks to Harvard Bookstore, uh, which is a great institution. I, I wanted to do many things. One is I wanted to understand how this style of politics that Gingrich practiced, a real 
uh, call smash mouth approach to, to partisanship, no guardrails, no restraint, uh, how it moved from being part of the GOP to being part of the Republican leadership. And this is the year 1989, uh, because of his takedown of the speaker, that he moves from being in that one position to the other. I, I also wanted to tell a story of polarization and what political scientists called asymmetric partisanship, where the Republican Party kind of moves in a much more extreme direction than the Democrats through a person, through a moment when something big happens, to, to give a narrative history of these issues that we talk about so people can see how this all came together. And I do believe Gingrich is a pretty formative figure in American politics. And, and it's in the 80s you see him come, come to power and use the media on his way uh, to becoming a leader. Well, let's get to the dramatic, dramatis personae. Uh, our main characters are uh, Newt Gingrich, also uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Speaker Wright, uh, Jim Wright. Um, I wrote about Newt Gingrich too in this book I have coming out called Reaganland about 1976 to 1980. And it was really quite astonishing uh, delving into the early part of his career uh, because he was such an outlier. One of the striking things was when he was elected to um, Congress in 1978 after trying three times, even before um, Congress has been seated, he's already being quoted in newspapers. By the end of the year, he's almost being quoted as if he is, he is a leader uh, of the Republican Party. And the reason seems to be his audacity. He's the only one who's talking about the possibility of, of the Republicans taking over the House of Representatives. Um, he wasn't always uh, identified with the conservative movement. So this was his third run. So why don't you take us through that very strange uh, history of this, this army brat from Pennsylvania named Newt Gingrich. Yeah, he's an army brat. He, he's from a working class family near Harrisburg. And for much of his younger life, he sees himself as a Rockefeller Republican. And he likes Richard Nixon very much because he believes that he's someone who wants to do for the Republicans what FDR did for the Democrats, build a broad coalition. And he sees himself as in the center of the party. And his first two runs are against this guy, Congressman Flint, who's an old Southern Democrat incumbent, had been there for a long time. Uh, and in 74 and 76, he basically outlines what he's gonna do the rest of his career, present the Democrats as a thoroughly, totally corrupt political establishment that needs to be booted. It's unethical, it's amoral, uh, there's nothing good about it, but he can't beat Flint. Uh, Flint has a powerful incumbent and Watergate weighs heavily on the GOP. And so finally, it, it's in 75 and 76, he starts to tie himself to this movement, to this conservative movement, in part uh, through Paul Weyrich, who is one of the activists, major activists, and runs this camp in Wisconsin for up and coming candidates. And he goes to it and he shines in the classroom, so to speak. He has all these ideas, he's very ambitious, and he's talking in 75 and 76 at this camp of the need for Republicans to nationalize what they're doing if they're ever gonna win power. He finally wins in 78, Flint retires, there's an open seat, he runs against Virginia Shepard who's a moderate Democrat from the state government, and he shows what he will do the rest of his career. Uh, he just devastates her character uh, in front of the Georgia voters. Right, I, I uh, came across a quote from the Atlanta Constitution uh, that really shows the paradox, I think kind of lurks in the back of your book, that this is a guy who's uh, making his appeal to voters based on uh, ethics. Um, the first and second times, the second time the main uh, paper in Atlanta, the Journal Constitution endorses him. The third time they say, the Gingrich approach seems to have gone beyond vigor and into demagoguery and plain lying. Uh, he's running with a fanaticism that only a starved dog can understand when it spots a foundling lamb. <laughs> right, and that's a paper that endorsed him before. Uh, and, and it was quite a transformation. And he also gets the endorsement of the, the black paper in town. Yeah, I, and early on, that was a big issue for him. He wanted to be a Republican who uh, brought African-American voters into the coalition, and he argued he would be very expansive. And by 78, it's clear that's not the direction he's moving. 
And but they, they, they still say nice things about him in this paper. Uh, lo and behold, he chooses his first target in 1979, and it, it is dot, dot, dot. Right, Charles Diggs, who's the head of the, or one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, who is in uh, a bind. He's been investigated for kickbacks from staff members, but he's a very prominent African-American legislator. And he sets his sights on him the minute he steps in and demands Diggs should not participate in anything while he's being investigated, starts to use his uh, rhetoric about him, and dismisses warnings from senior Republicans who say it might not be the best thing for a Southern conservative to focus on an African-American legislator right off the bat. He doesn't care. Uh, and this is how he gets in the papers very early on. Yes, and he got in at least one article in the paper I discovered. He actually um, joined some kind of coalition or commission or, or panel that was investigating the election of the, the chairman at the time of the Congressional Black Caucus, Perrin Mitchell of Maryland, who was beaten, uh, who, who, who beat with 80% of the vote, a, a member of Lyndon LaRouche's political cult. And they were saying that, that Perrin Mitchell had somehow stolen the election. So he was just kind of like, you know, throwing all kinds of stuff at the wall and seeing what would stick. Uh, him and Weyrich also tried, uh, got up a little scheme to try and um, take down uh, Tip O'Neill in 1979. They claim that they had like votes between, you know, like a conservative Republicans and Southern Democrats, but he's just trying and probing and probing and probing for weakness, like a, like a guerrilla general. And promoting his message. The Tip O'Neill thing's really interesting. He has a letter writing campaign where he's trying to convince uh, colleagues that O'Neill shouldn't be the speaker. And, and after the 1980 election, he, he has a really formal operation with where yeah. you're and the argument is Reagan won, and so that's where the country that's is. The country is, yeah. And it doesn't work, but Gingrich actually says he had, that wasn't his focus anyway. The focus was getting the letter out there. And yes. The focus was really promoting this idea that the House Democrats were not representative of what right. the country is about. And he has this, you know, he calls it, even then, you know, it's a now cliche, he says he's playing three dimensional chess. You know, he's, he's working out his, you know, decade long plan. Um, I actually, um, so one of our uh, colleagues, uh, uh, is it Brooks Flippin, right? He wrote a, a great biography of um, right. your other character, who we'll talk about, Jim Wright. Uh, he quotes a letter that Jim Wright got uh, that year during the Diggs business. Um, My head is off to the courageous congressman from Georgia. I'm kind of thinking maybe uh, one of, uh, either Gingrich or one of his staffers was possibly writing letters to um, congressmen talking about how, how nifty this new Gingrich kid was. Do you, do, 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 you, do you share my suspicion? It, it could be. I mean, most of what I've seen from Wright early on is pretty uh, unfavorable about who he is. He, he called him a red hot. He said he was employing nasty McCarthyite tactics. And, you know, Wright's big mistake in perception early on is that Gingrich would go away. Well, who's this guy, Jim Wright? He's the other guy who's- Jim Wright's, you know, I, I have no heroes in the book. Jim Wright's an old school Texas Democrat came into office in the 1950s, very much a believer in the New Deal, great society. He'd been majority leader, uh, elected in 76 for the Democrats, which is an important position. And he's elected in this fluke uh, election where the two liberals who represent the uh, post-Watergate party, um, Phil Burton and Richard Bowling, they split the vote. And so this old school Democrat gets in. And he's someone who's not well liked, even among Democrats personally. He can be very tough, but he's an old school legislator. He doesn't think about how things are going to look. He doesn't like to talk to the media. And he very much believes that the system will hold. Um, and, and won't let uh, reporters record him when, when they interview him. I thought that was pretty interesting. The, no, it's, it, that, that's a true story. And he doesn't do that until the very end of his scandal when he realizes he has to be more open with reporters because he's getting eaten alive uh, in, in right well let's and let's talk about the context here actually most of what i learned about congressional reform i learned from your great book i was just doing a little craning on my neck to see if i could see the z's <laughs> in my bookshelf but uh so i forgot the title of course uh but um capitol hill. You, on capitol hill right and, and and one of the things you write about in that book is how this young generation early 70s mostly associated with people elected after watergate but some before um, completely transformed how the House of Representatives ran. And what was that transformation? And why did that, um, 
make uh, Jim Wright such an unusual figure to rise to the top of the heap? Well, they're putting through all kinds of reforms in the second half of the 70s to open up the political process and tr try to create mechanisms of accountability. So in 1978, for example, they let television cameras cover all uh, the proceedings on the floor of the House, which is meant to throw uh, sunlight onto the deliberations and end some of the secrecy. And C-SPAN comes on the air the following year. They create ethics rules uh, that put limits on how much can you earn speaking to private groups and requiring disclosure forms so that reporters can see where are you making money uh, and who's giving you money. And same with campaign uh, finance. Uh, there's uh, new rules on, on contributions, though no public funding of congressional elections. So there's reforms, sunshine, accountability. That's very much how Congress responds to Watergate with limits. And that's an important part of the story. Democrats don't clean house, um, but they do put those into place. So in a sense, it renders Jim Wright a vulnerable figure from the start because he represents precisely the old ways of doing business that these young cats are trying to overturn. Absolutely. That's why it was a surprise when he won the majority leader position in 76. And it will be equally problematic to many younger Democrats when he becomes speaker in 1987. This is not the person who's supposed to be at the head of the party by the 1980s. Uh, I mean, he right. was a tough partisan and he did stand up in the minds of many Democrats to Reagan uh, as majority leader, um, but he was not uh, a Watergate baby. Right, he but was it was quite, one of the things I think that comes across in the book is this was really quite the incomplete uh, revolution, this transformation of Congress into this, you know, this, this the sunshine is the best disinfectant. And, I think the best metaphor for this is you have an image in the book of the actual office where the ethics committee meets. And it's not exactly one of these, you know, kind of uh, uh, Baroque, lovely, you know, kind of high ceiling, vaulted ceilings. It's, they're in the basement and there's like, the, the, there's like buckets <laughs> because this is where the, 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 the pipes are leaking. You know? right. so, and, the, and the ethics committee is known as a joke uh, during the 70s and early 80s. And the joke is, if you want to kill an ethics investigation, right. send it to the ethics committee. So a big part of how I got into this stuff was I would still steal my brother's uh, Dunes, my older brother, du older brother's Doonesbury books. Uh -huh. You know, that's how I learned about Korea Gate. And one of the, the congressmen, one of the characters in the, the, the strip is Lacey Davenport. It's this very high minded liberal Republican. And she's telling one of her friends about this Korea Gate scandal which involves this basically this operative of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency buying off congressmen. No one knew he was in the Korean Central Intelligence Agency to try to get them to support America staying in uh, their military bases, staying, staying in Korea. And she's like, this, this is a terrible scandal. This could be dozens of congressmen in both, both uh, parties who are involved. And uh, you know, people could be going down. And uh, her interlocutor says, well, how many of them are in the ethics committee? You know, the ethics committee was like, you know, the graveyard for ethics, right? But Newt Gingrich knows that at least on the level of discourse, at least on the level of public representations, that this idea that Congress should be more ethical has taken abroad in the land. And uh, uh, so he weaponizes really all this stuff uh, and figures out how to turn it against the Democratic Party, which passes the ethic rules in the first place. So how would you describe him, you know, kind of weaponizing ethics? Well, this is how he goes after Jim Wright. So Jim Wright becomes the speaker when O'Neill retires. And in 1987, he's the new speaker. And he instantly picks up on investigative journalists who had been looking into all sorts of stories about Wright, uh, shady aspects of his career. One is that he would sell this book of speeches in bulk whenever he spoke to a trade association or at a university instead of getting a speaking fee. 55% uh, royalties. Yeah, and that was, a, I mean, that was fine with the ethics rules. The ethics rules capped how much you could earn in speaking, but you could make as much as you want in book royalties. But I mean, that's not a thing of value. Right, <laughs> that's, that's right. So we um, could talk for two hours. Yeah. So he, no, he picks up on that and he starts to say there's something wrong with that. And this shows he's, he's up to something shady. He picks up on this uh, business partnership he had with a real estate developer and friend 
back in Fort Worth named George Malik, uh, and they invested in, in different oil operations. Uh, it was not illegal to do that. Uh, that fell within the rules, but there are enough stories that you piece all this together. And Gingrich said it must add up to him being the most corrupt speaker in American history. Right. Uh, and, and that's how he, and, and he used the ethics rule as the basis for that judgment. He kept saying, this violates what Congress did in the 1970s, right. and the speaker shouldn't be in power. And an important sort of variable or historical actor in all this, you know, is the media, is the political press. You know, when I did my, you know, 76 to 80 book, one of the things that really struck me was that the post Watergate press was so eager to kind of, you know, follow supposedly in the footsteps of Woodward and Bernstein, they were constantly elevating peccadillos to the status of major stories. You know, the Playboy interview of Jimmy Carter, or, you know, a racist joke that his agriculture secretary, you know, said, no one knew that Earl Butts was the guy who completely transformed American agriculture more than any human being in the history of mankind, right? But they do know he told, you know, a racist, dirty joke. How do you think the transformation of the post-Watergate media, which is always on the, the hunt for these kind of wisps of smoke, played into this? It's a big part of the story. I mean, they're, they're constantly digging up stories, but often there's no context. They don't have a sense, many of the reporters, uh, you know, how does this weigh relative to what other members are doing or what's legitimate and not? Uh, and they're putting this out there in, in front of a very eager uh, partisan system. Uh, someone like Gingrich who, who eats this stuff up uh, and is able, able to use it. I don't think they always knew what they were getting themselves right. into. I'm quite callow. As well, I, have, I have a story in there about a guy, a very good, smart reporter. I wasn't going to mention any names, but you know, you can. <laughs> well, he's in the book, uh, Robert Wright, smart reporter and not related to Jim Wright. He had just joined the New Republic and they asked him to write a piece about Wright uh, becoming a speaker. And, and he writes a, a piece in the New Republic, when it was still, it, it mattered very much at the time what the magazine was saying in Washington. Like magazine of uh, Air Force One. Right, <laughs> right. And, uh, and it was critical. It was saying Wright isn't the right person for this moment. He's, he's an old school politician. Um, and, and it became a big thing. It played into get what Gingrich was saying very well. But Wright himself even admitted, and, and I, I write this in the book, he didn't really know much about Congress when he wrote that. And... Uh, as questions came to him as the author of the piece, he really was fumbling to answer basic things like, was this different than what other legislators right. were allowed to do? But boy, when Gingrich got his hands on an article like that, he yeah. circulated it, he distributed it, and they lost control. So I think the reporters uh, often fueled this environment um, unwittingly. Right. And then once, you know, he's kind of in Gingrich's crosshairs and the ethics committee really feels it has no choice than to kind of initiate some kind of information. I was really struck at how um, the Democratic Party, both kind of the reform wing and the old school wing, kind of did politics, how poorly uh, suited they were to playing the kind of game that Newt Gingrich was playing. And this actually gets into one of my critiques. I'm very... Um, I'm very uh, down on the idea of describing America as polarized, right? So I appreciate that political scientists talk about it as asymmetrical polarization, right? Which, but the metaphor polarization really suggests some sort of balance, you know, extremists on both sides. Um, the Republic, the Democrats played to um, type in, in that um, there's a joke about liberals, you know, not, a, not even being able to take their own side in an argument. And, you know, um, Wright hires this lawyer who decides his whole um, approach is going to be, he literally says, it's not illegal to get as close to the line as possible. You know, uh, I mean, he's just completely ill adept to this kind of media politics, right? And um, then uh, what, was, what, was, what was the other, um, um, what was, well, was, I, I, remember, I remember like, uh, you know, when Richard Nixon told, you know, like, uh, told David Frost, I gave them a sword. You know, it's like the Democrats kind of kept on giving them them swords. You know, um, one of their arguments was, well, if we if we take on right for what he's doing, um, then everyone in Congress will be vulnerable. And I'm thinking, well, geez, you know, maybe Newt Gingrich wasn't the best 
you know, messenger, you know, because he's, as you make quite plain in the book, profoundly corrupt, right? I mean, if you think that everything, if you're a conservative and you believe the whole world operates according to market incentives, you're not going to have any problem being on the take because, you know, I think um, one of the one of the problems that Republicans of the era have with Democrats is, is, is not their ethics, but the fact that they have a method of winning elections, which is basically liberalism. You know, they kind of help people do stuff by voting them favors from the federal treasury. And that just drives them crazy and drives them to distraction. And maybe, and, and then, on, you know, the other side, you have the Democrats saying, well, this is just how the system works. And what I wanted to ask you is, um, um, do you think, in the end, you kind of come to a conclusion that this ratchet only kind of goes in one, one way? And that once people kind of put put aside the sort of norms of deference and comity and bipartisanship, bipartisan cooperation, once people uh, stop doing that, um, then you've kind of opened the floodgates to a war of all against all. I'm not quite sure I agree because I think Democrats' response to a party becoming more ideological has often become less ideological. Mm -hmm. You know, Democrats' response to a a, car, a party, you know, breaking all the norms is to fetishize the norms. You know, um, uh, the Democrats' response to the new Gingrichization of American politics is to elevate a guy who says there is no red America, there is no blue America. Again, not a polarity so much. But what I wanted to ask is, do you think that um, outside of this question of of um, that everyone is going to become, you know, sort of um, uh, interested in breaking the institution in order to defeat the other side? Was, was the system in which you could sell 98% of your books in bulk, you know, a system in which, you know, he, 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 he chose as his advisors, the executives of a, 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 a oil company, Coastal Corporation. I looked it up and their, their CEO, it turns out, was the, the basis for J.R. Ewing in, in, in Dallas, right? I mean, maybe this was the system that really you know, needed some serious interrogation. What do you think? Well, I think, look, two parts. On the first part, I don't disagree at all. I mean, I, I think certainly in my book, the, the counterpunch is a lot weaker than what Gingrich is willing to deliver. And, and that is a story of two parties. Um, I, I, I think um, you can say, you can, everyone can have their opinion on polarization, but it's very clear that one party uh, moves in a very different direction, not just ideologically, but strategically. And you see that in the story. Jim Wright, even with some Democrats saying, you have to be a lot tougher with this guy, he's corrupt. They're, raise his ethics. Uh, he won't do it. And also, his party basically gives him up. There was no reason he had to resign. I mean, the yep. great what if would be if, if he hadn't resigned, the Democrats said, ignore Gingrich. We have the votes. We have yeah. the majority. And but that was kind of part of yeah, Gingrich's strategic genius was he realized that there were a lot of people in the Democrats who were serious about ethics. For him, it was just a, a, a scam, that's right? A, but he could get exactly. Ralph Nader. He could get Common Cause. You know, he could get the liberals. And he that's did. Exactly right. He could that's get the exactly. New York Times op-ed. It's the weaponization of norms that I see going on since you know, the James C. Calhoun days, you know, yeah. the reactionaries do. But your second point is true as well, meaning uh, the reforms of the 70s only went halfway. There were a lot of problems with the, the House. There still are today with how Congress runs. And Democrats in control didn't go far enough. So, so they created a system that was far from perfect. And then you have a speaker who doesn't think through something like, hiring, uh, you know, two people connected to an oil company like that to advise him, uh, not hiring them, but bringing them on right as he's being investigated for this. Uh, another story in the book involves uh, someone who is one of his top advisors and a bombshell story comes out toward the end of this about his background where he had brutally assaulted a woman and very served very little time and was dating one of Wright's daughters. And, this is not how he thinks about politics. Um, so there was a lot of brokenness that Gingrich was exploiting. That doesn't mean, though, that in raising questions about how Congress works, uh, you then break the institution yeah. and adopt a new style of governing where governing will be basically impossible. Uh, you don't burn down the house necessarily. And uh, I think that was what he did. Right. So one more question then before we open it up. 
Um, so you're, you're, you're writing about the history of what you call the new Republican Party. You know, so do I, right? It's, it's basically the party who, which, you know, hopefully reached its apotheosis, the apex, the nadir, you know, of its, of its normlessness with the current president. Um, I take the story personally back to my personal work, takes the story back to, you know, like the late 1950s when Barry Goldwater arises, taking on just as Newt Gingrich took on sort of like the, the, the center of his own party, Barry Goldwater takes on Eisenhower and says he heard the siren song of socialism in his, in his 1958 budget, goes through you know, the 60s and uh, of course Watergate and the 80s and Newt Gingrich. Um, this particular moment in 1989, how do you situate it within, and you know, I mean, this is what we do where us historians are all pedants um, saying, what about this? This thing he's saying is, Fresh and novel happened this time, and da 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 da. And, you know what about what 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 William Sapphire did to Bert Bert uh, Lance, and you know et cetera et cetera. How do you situate this particular moment in the history of the new Republican Party, the conservative movement driven Republican Party, the authoritarian Republican Party, the 1989-1990 movement in the long history of the Republican Party? Well, look, you have. I, I think that the other part of being a historian is not just the what about this, but you can see the different strands that kind of come together in any moment. And I think the, the elements of Republican politics you've been tracing for a long time now with Goldwater as a key figure, though losing, setting the template ideologically for sure for the party, Nixon land, uh, that element of Republican politics. What's interesting about Gingrich is to see this politician, a power broker, really uh, a power broker, kind of introduce the way this is going to work in the party, the, the, yeah. the way this is going to be the governing strategy, the way in which the party leaders are going to move in a way that allows all those elements to be central. Yeah. Uh, Centrality, how, yeah. I mean, to me, the big, the big story of the Trump era and before it, the Gingrich era is really kind of things that always existed within the conservative party yes. Republican coalition. Bob Bauman was interested in destroying the, the, the productivity of Congress you know, a right. congressman who was you know, part of the new right in the 1970s, right? But he never rose. And you, you talk a lot, actually, about in interesting ways about the complicity of the rest of the Republican Party, how this guy, Bob Michael, who was ahead of Newt Gingrich as, as, as the minority leader, often gets a pass that he was surely uh, and, and simply an adversary to what Newt, Newt Gingrich was doing. And you're saying, no, he saw that it worked and he kind of let his, let his objections kind of fade by the wayside. That's a big part of the story. Uh, Michael's the quintessential old school Republican get along kind of person. He, he calls in, in discussions with Wright. He's always saying he knows how dangerous Gingrich is, but he replicates his rhetoric and he often doesn't stop him. He understands exactly what Gingrich is doing. And that's a story too in reactionary <laughs> moments all the time. I mean, Eisenhower yep. lets McCarthy go you know, the business class in, 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 in Weimar Germany thinks that this guy with the mustache can be controlled, but because taking the low road and using the lowest common denominator and activating dem demagogic principles is a very powerful thing. And that's why norms are so powerful in keeping these fragile institutions together are so important. Well, let's go, time, let's, yeah. let's, let's, sorry, let's, I mean, I'm just saying this, yeah, time, this time, I mean, the story in 89 isn't just the Jim Wright Falls, but the Republicans vote to make him a House Minority Whip, which is they reward him. It's a leadership right. position. So they take the Joe McCarthy and they make right. him a leader. That's and right. That's, that's a useful, you know, useful tool. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Very good point. So when I uh, mentioned I was doing this on Facebook, my Facebook friends all said, "Ask him this, ask him that," and I said, "You come in and you ask him." So one of uh, them, a gentleman named John Topoleski says, uh, was, is the Gingrich approach to treat our democracy in an effort to destroy our institutions? I think he means, was it an effort to destroy our institutions or is it just a different band of politics when at any cost? So I think he, he, he's, 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 he's saying, isn't this what anyone would do if they were in this position and they had been in the minority for so long? Uh, I recognize that Gingrich likely harmed Congress, but will we survive it or are we doomed? People love that question, yeah. Uh, I would love to ask us historians if we're doomed or not. Yes. I would say that's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys. 
Yeah, I mean, on the anyone would do it, that, that's just not true. And uh, even with what we're talking about, the difference with the Democratic Party, not everyone does it. There's a very different reaction uh, to try to repair and try to uh, restore rather than to try to tear apart. Uh, even the Republicans who let him in the door, there are some who, who aren't still like totally in on, on what he's going to do. Uh, I'm not sure he was thinking in his head, I'm going to tear down all the institutions, but he's embracing a style of politics where the risk is very clear. People are telling him all the time, you can't speak this way uh, about the opposition. You can't do this with the basic You can't say he didn't know. You can't say no one told him. No, he was told he didn't. That was not, he was, uh, he was not focused on that. And the future, I don't know, maybe you know the answer. Uh, yeah. We're doing, I'm hoping <laughs> it's up to not, you, dear reader. Uh, to you, dear reader. Well, this, this is a good question from Megan Marshall. Um, it, it's interesting because in, in light of your career, you, you, you're kind of known as one of the deans of, maybe they call it the new political history, right? But they just mean really kind of political history. It's, uh, there's this idea that historians have kind of gone out in the wacko left field. No one writes about kings and wars anymore. But here's this guy, Princeton, who writes these wonderful books about Congress and presidents and voting. Um, and I think this is kind of related to that. He, she kind of asked the, um, the war and peace question, the, the, the Tolstoy question. I wonder if you both would support the view that history is made in crucial ways by individuals and by extension, biography is a usual genre for historians to pr pursue, uh, not a popular notion among, I'm gonna say academic historians in recent decades. So what's your thoughts about um, the role of individuals? I think it matters. I mean, I, I actually spent much of my career not writing just about individuals and looking at structures and institutions. And I, I believe all that matters, you know, and I, my last book dealt with questions of how the media changes as a whole. Uh, but I also think people really make a difference. And this book, in some ways, is an attempt to express that voice. We we, even in our uh, discussions of what happened to American politics, we often miss the figures uh, who, who are important. Goldwater was important in 64 mm -hmm. in introducing this ideological right-wing shift. Gingrich is important in legitimating uh, everything we see today. And I think there's a big role for that biographical narrative uh, uh, approach, not just stylistically, it, it's easier to read, it's more pleasant to read sometimes, as a more story, copies. but it's important because otherwise everything's so inevitable uh, yeah. that you almost throw up your hands and can look at the history and say, well, this is how we ended up here and this is how it was going to be. Yeah. Um, that's not uh, how history yeah. works. And, and, and to get back to the last question, I mean, is there hope for us? I mean, there is no hope for us unless there's strong leadership, right? And people with a strong moral vision and who have that ineffable ability to get across the masses of people uh, to maybe um, sacrifice the short term for the long term. And so leaders are important. My way of getting at this issue is um, kind of inside out. I mean, I write books, you know, that, you know, uh, I'm not a professor. I write for the popular market. And, you know, I'm in a sense earn my living by how many people, how many readers I get. And I always joke that, um, you know, my books aren't about presidents. They just put presidents on the cover because those are the ones that sell the copies. Uh -huh. I said that in, in, in the um, preface to Nixon Land, which is kind of my most popular and best known book, that the subject of this book isn't Richard Nixon. It's the voter who uh, chose Lyndon Johnson in 1964 because it seemed crazy to do anything else. Yeah. Who, the same voter in 1972, chose Richard Nixon because it seemed crazy to do anything else. To me, what's important in writing biographically, uh, when you write history, when you write political history, is, you know, yes, these guys are women, hopefully, and what they do and what they think and their idiosyncrasies are very important for changing the course of history. But to me, the more interesting subject and the more interesting problem is why the greater public is attracted and gravitates to these people, right? What kind of psychological, you know, I'm reading, you know, Mary Trump's book. And she really um, expresses how I think about political history. America has chosen a man with all these pathologies. She traces these pathologies to his childhood as I do in my own biographical work. And his neuroses in a sense match the neuroses of people who support him. You know, people who supported Barry Goldwater, uh, I, I'm gonna say people who support, I meant to say Barack Obama, people who support Barack Obama, a lot of them supported 
him because they identified with his deepest strivings, the idea that opposites and kind of um, um, uh, uh, um, kind of confusing multiple identities can be, you know, united into this kind of um, uplifting whole, right? And that obviously within Barack Obama's biography goes back to his childhood. He's written about that quite eloquently, that people identified with Richard, the Richard Nixon of Watergate, not in spite of the crimes he committed, but in some sense because of him, because now we have a language to talk about it because he was sticking it to the liberals, right? He was, he was he, because of his resentments against, you know, kind of the liberal highborn swells who told everyone else how to think and act, you know, they identify with him. Now we kind of have a better grasp of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love biography because it's a great tool for talking about something that's much harder to get at, which is kind of the mass mind you know, the kind of Borg that's out there, public opinion. The other, I mean, the other trick to it, I think, uh, is to just contextualize the individual leader. Uh, and, and, and that's a, a useful way to combine the institutional view and the person. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, I have about cable television and how yeah. it's changing the Talk list. radio. What about talk radio? Well, talk radio is, you know, really booming in the late 80s uh, after the Fairness Doctrine from 87 to 92. Gingrich is doing a lot of what he does before really talk radio is a platform. He's doing the mainstream media, as he would call it, um, the, the networks, big cable. Uh, but it does come into play. In 1989, in my story, uh, there's a whole debate over raising uh, the congressional pay, uh, the salaries for legislators. And the, uh, this is in January of 1989. Wright's being investigated. He's already politically frail. And this pay raise falls on his lap and many Democrats think he's handling it poorly, but talk radio picks this up as a big issue. And all across the country, there are these hosts who are talking about a Tea Party revolt against the Democrats in Congress, send in your tea bags to members to say this is outrageous. Uh, and, and they really play into the arguments Gingrich is making about how corrupt the Democrats are and they're still paying themselves more money. Uh, so it becomes an important voice in, in part of what Gingrich is doing. Yeah. And it, you know, so much of how Congress works on issues like pay raises is to try to hide, not, kind of hide their hand. You know, in fact, Ronald Reagan cooperates with this. He comes up with this whole, you know, kind of pay raise commission yeah. that says, we'll recommend a pay raise and you don't even have to vote for it. You can kind of, kind of opt out. And basically that's what they're kind of, uh, the masses are saying, you know, opt out. You know, all these backroom deals, which really is the world that Jim Wright thrived in just like his, you know, mentor Sam Rayburn thrived in, you know, no, put it in the forefront, like the kind of Watergate reformers were saying. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, Wright couldn't understand. That's a great example where he couldn't understand. He was just following the process, uh, this bizarre kind of Byzantine process for raising uh, the salaries without actually having to vote on it, just basically letting and, you know, it go. Yeah, and that's kind of the old, unfortunately with the old system, it did that's ask it. a lot of deference of people. That's right. exactly right. Uh, but that wasn't how the right presented it. And the right was much more effective on this issue. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they call them right wing populists. They're reaching exactly. out to the voice of the people. You know, I used to say I had a friend, a British friend, Sasha Bransky, a great journalist. And I was like, it was when the Tea Party was going on. They said, I'm so sick of America. I'm so sick of writing these, about these, you know, crazy right wingers. In England, it's so much more sensible. You don't have people, you know, like, you know, want, wanting, you know, like every, every criminal be, to be put to death and every politician to be tarred and feathered. He's like, oh, sure they do. They just don't, they, 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 they have deference in England. You know, they don't feel, they don't feel they have the, um, I love America. Everyone thinks that what they think is of important, right? And, you know, it's, uh, that's one of the paradoxes of democracy, right? Um, you know, they're not gonna come up with bluegrass or jazz in England, you know? Uh, but you know, uh, that's because there's too much deference. But then suddenly the populist wave comes there and suddenly you know, they're out of the European Union and um, who knows what'll happen. Uh, the great question from Stephen Pugh. Uh, is there an effective counter strategy to Gingrich's bomb throwing? Specifically, how can the media avoid being used as a partisan weapon? Well, I think the, the media reporters have to be more explicit when they're uh, covering uh, people back then who are just saying things that are not, not true. It's the same problem we have today. So, so if Newt Gingrich is out there making and launching smear against every Democrat with 
wild accusations or put together accusations. There is a role for journalism, objective journalism, to still call it for what it is. Uh, if you have a person in 1989 attacking the speaker for a book deal when he himself is uh, it, it being investigated for a book deal. Well, some say. Some say. Uh, it has to be reported on. And I think that's true today. It's the same uh, uh, gymnastics, so to speak, reporters seem to be having yeah. about how to deal with President Trump, which doesn't seem particularly difficult. If, right. if he's not telling the truth, that is the story, uh, right. rather than just how you tell the story. Right. And so I think it, my book is definitely an early lesson of how the uh, GOP was spinning reporters in circles um, by just throwing this out there. So it's, it's a, I think it's pretty vital. And we're seeing that play out right now. Yeah, I, I, now I get on my own soapbox and say my answer to this is the, the metaphor of polarization actually does active damage to that process. Um, because first of all, it, it, uh, it reinforces the professional norm that if the Democrats say something, that there are two parties and that therefore there are two sides to every issue, the Republican side and the Democratic side have to get equal weight, that structurally advantages the side that's willing to lie um, because they're always get their lie reported, right? So like you have one side, you know, that takes over the Senate, right? And their response is to um, basically decide that there's not gonna be a Supreme Court justice appointed by a Democratic president, so they steal a seat. Previous to that, when the Democrats had the Senate, Patrick Leahy's response was to, um, uh, to broaden the blue slip process, which gave every um, senator basically uh, the power to, um, basically it meant that every, every, every judicial nominee had to have buy-in from both parties. So it's, it's the opposite if, if, if on one side you have cooperation and pluralism and the other side you have stealing, you know, I guess those are opposites, right? But the metaphor of polar polarity um, takes us away from saying what is actually happening? What is the Republican Party actually doing? What have they done in the last 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 years to um, weaponize the norms of civility, to weaponize the norms of ethics um, that Democrats disadvantage themselves by politically by upholding and how that process just keeps on. The, that would not work were the, were the, were the referees not um, basically looking for equal sins to report on. And you saw that in 1972 with Watergate. Every time the Washington Post had a big Watergate story about some terrible uh, thing about Richard Nixon's secret fund paying off burglaries, you'd find some article about some picky own finance, uh, campaign finance reporting uh, sin from the McGovern campaign, right? Yeah. Because that image of that the two sides have to be a polarity. I mean, I would add, it's also in the history. And I think historians also have a job to do. There, there is a natural tendency to try to present it as a history of two parties moving farther apart, rather than looking at really fundamental differences in what the parties became and, and how they practiced politics. And it, it's funny, if you write about someone like Gingrich, instantly the question is, but didn't Democrats, weren't they partisan too? Isn't, you know, basically everyone was doing this. And, that's in many ways the most dishonest history because then you're not really telling what happened and you're not really telling the imbalance uh, between the, the two parties. So I think there's a role in the history we're going to tell now and you yeah. started, I've started of this post 60s period, like with journalism to capture yeah. this. And that's an honest accounting. That's not actually a yeah. partisan accounting. To, to phrase it again, you're, say it's all the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to phrase uh, your book uh, about uh, foreign policy. Uh, uh, um, uh, arsenal of democracy. Yes. It's basically an argument that this idea that politics has always stopped at the water's edge is nonsense. Here are all the ways foreign policy has been weaponized usually by Republicans. Okay, so I got a great question. You were talking, we're criticizing historians. Uh, Nate Bauer asks, are either of you personally or professionally offended by Newt Gingrich calling himself a historian? <laughs> I'm not going to answer because someone said I'm talking too much. So you, you no, I, I, I'm fine. He has his PhD in history. He taught for a few years. I'm more interested in how he uses that. And he did use it all the time, still does, uh, really to present himself as an ideas Republican, a, a professor, politician, which really isn't what he's about. And it kind of misses what he's up to. Um, but 
I'm not a, I'm not offended. He can call himself whatever he wants. Uh, I, I'm interested in what he did. Okay. Someone wants to know, wasn't Clinton Gingrich's partner in crime at one point? I don't know what, 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 what Dale Rogers, there was Dale a, Evans is referring to. Uh, there was a book by Steve Gillen. I think that's it. it. Yeah. And in, uh, it's about in 1997, they were secretly negotiating a deficit reduction bill, which would cut entitlement, social security, cut Medicare. Uh, it was this grand bargain. And Gillen argues this was real, it was serious, and that the two liked each other for a brief spell, and then everything fell apart once the impeachment began. So I assume that's what they're referring yeah. to. Um what was the deal with Gingrich's? Wasn't there a book that he was publishing with Harper Collins and, and, and Rupert Murdoch was involved? Was, what was the scandal with that? Well, I'm not sure which scandal that was. I mean, <laughs> there, there's one early in his career uh, where he's being paid as he's running his campaign by local supporters to write this novel, which never, that was 78. Really, yeah. never comes out. Then he's paid in the scandal uh, in 1989 is interest groups are paying him to help promote his book. Uh, interest groups, this is while right is happening. Then there's the scandal that he's fined for, his speaker, that involves GOPAC and the distribution of okay. audio tapes. So it wasn't what I was thinking. Maybe that was a different- uh, Maybe another. There's lots of these stories. And I mean, he is not someone who's seen as very clean. Yeah. Well, so this is interesting. I mean, if you're going to defend the role of individuals in writing history, this is a really- uh, a question that kind of forces you to um, really defend that. Was the rise of Gingrich and the shift of the GOP to the South inevitable? Or if the 80s had played differently for the Dems with non-right leadership, non-Jim Wright leadership, could they have preserved their permanent majority past 1994? Sure, it was definitely not inevitable. I mean, I don't think it was inevitable Gingrich would even enter the leadership. He could have certainly been stopped. I don't know if, if he had never been elected as House Minority Whip, he wasn't on the path to the speaker. It's not clear another Gingrich would have been that person, even with the southernization of the party. There are different choices and different leaders could have tapped into these constituencies that you've written about and, and, and moved them in different ways or practiced politics in different ways. Uh, 94 wasn't even inevitable. And some of this is about how the Democrats handled it. Yes, if there had been a non-Jim Wright speaker, someone might have more forcefully responded uh, to Gingrich. The Democrats might have protected Jim Wright, basically said, we're not going to force him to resign. You resign uh, to, to Gingrich, meaning they didn't have to do this. And so, yes, there's a million ways in which you might not get 94. You might not get a speaker Gingrich. You might get different kinds of leaders. Um, so so I'm a, I do believe that. Um, well, here's, here's a related question from a Karen Ruther. Uh, she says, why do Dems play by the rules and the Republicans break them and get away with it? Look, part of it's the ideological fabric of the party. Uh, part of it is Democrats still, even though Republicans use government all the time, Democrats believe in it and they argue for it. And they argue for it in places uh, that are harder to get government intervention. It's a lot harder to get uh, the government intervene on social safety net issues than it is to give away money to military contracts. And if you believe in government at some level, you can't embrace a partisanship that is totally destructive because then you make government dysfunctional. You actually hand Republicans their argument. And so I think the parties are different. For Republicans, they're fine if things become dysfunctional. It fits what they're saying from the start. And so I think the parties are very different because of that. Right, and they can't say, we're trying to destroy the government. They say, we're trying to be ethical. Yeah, uh, uh, Bob Borisaj says that uh, Republicans rob the postman and then complain when the mail doesn't get delivered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Uh, which is kind of becoming all too little, literal now. Uh, someone with a wonderful Irish name that I'm not gonna pronounce uh, says, uh, do you think this new Republicanism has benefits for the nation it seems to me that many people have woken up to politics, even if voter participation and weak, in particular when it is not a presidential election. Maybe a, a, the worse, the better. Uh, I don't know. What is it, what, how do you respond to that question? Maybe. So maybe the, the deterioration of politics in, inspires new movements and inspires efforts to repair it. That's the post-Watergate story, or at least hope. Unfortunately, after Watergate, that wasn't exactly what happened. So 
that's kind of a good reminder. Uh, Nixon did inspire a lot of people to say we need a better politics, as did LBJ in Vietnam, but it's not clear we moved in that direction. So uh, I'll give a little optimism. Yes, it, it could be this moment where President Trump is essentially exposing so much of what's been going on for a long time and, and how the party works that it might lead to changes and demands from new generations for change uh, and, a, and a better future. On the other hand, like you, I, I probably could be very pessimistic and say we could kind of dive deeper into this muck. Mm. We have a charismatic, handsome movie star who's asked us a question. His name's Harold Pollack. Uh, right now, discourse about policy outcomes seems dominated by economists, while discourse about political outcomes uh, seems dominated by political scientists who study incentives created by the structures of legislative and presidential politics. A bit of a econom economist thinking on both sides. How might this discourse be different if historical scholarship and insights played a larger role in this discussion? Well, I think all the issues we've just discussed over the hour are natural for historians to talk about. Uh, to really look at electorates and movements and how they impact government, to look at leadership and look at uh, key individuals uh, and, and mo turning point moments. You know, uh, the, the nomination of Goldwater in 64 matters. Gingrich getting this position matters. Uh, and that's the kind of discussion that's important in politics to, to really understand uh, the give and take of, of how this all works. And also to look at rhetoric. I mean, we, we do a lot of that as historians. What people say matters. Uh, where economists don't always do that. Political scientists are less interested. I think we always you know, put- Gingrich certainly in. thinks words matter, right? That was Essence Gingrich. You know, Speak Like Newt is the title of a chapter. It's the title of a memo. It's not the title, but it's in a memo that he distributed in 1990 to Republicans. If you want to speak like Newt, say words like sick, traitor, uh, you know, radical, corrupt. Uh, and, and I think historians naturally look at that part of politics, movements, people, turning points, language. We bring a lot to the table that we need to think of. Contingency. There are no models because the variables change. Exactly. Um, this is a good one. Alan Spite asks, uh, Gingrich is associated with an intense political anger, something that we characterize with Republicans and Tea Party figures to this day. To what do you most attribute that anger and why does it still seem to characterize Republicans even when they're in power? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, I think it's a politics of rage that, that's clearly uh, essential. I, in the last certainly decade or so, a lot of that rage is driven from a party and agenda that doesn't match what is happening in a lot of the country. Uh, it's not what they imagine the country should be. It's not moving in the direction that a lot of Republicans want or a lot of Republican voters want. And that angers people. That is a rage. I'd say part of it is politicians, they play to it. I mean, uh, you saw that in Nixon land, you see that in my book. This is a leadership of division. It, it doesn't play to no red and blue America. As Obama said, it's saying there is a red and blue America. Let's exacerbate that. So right. I think the rage is being driven top down and bottom up. Right. Well, we have one last question and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those toughies. Uh, Post-Trump, where does the Republican Party go? Does Gingrich come back? How does the party reinvent itself? Or does the party of Trump survive? I think it, uh, the person needs to say, plus a third party. Are we gonna go Whig, Whig Republican? I don't see any change in the near future. It's not the party of Trump. Trump is part of the Republican party. And right. uh, it's not gonna, there, there's no evidence that the Lincoln project, for example, is representative of a mass movement in the Republican party. Even if you have Republican defections in the 220 vote, my guess is the party is still where it's gonna be. They might be scared that Trump is too costly for them. But, but I don't think this party's changing for a while. And I think when you have a name like Tucker Carlson to be floated as the next uh, presidential Republican candidate, it tells you a lot about where the party might be moving. So you said that the Republican party is, is not the party of Trump, that Trump and the Republican party are continuous with one another. Yeah, this is the party that allowed for a Trump to be president. It's allowed for him to sustain support in the Republican Party. This Republican Party we've been studying produced this presidency. He didn't capture the party. Excellent. Last word. 
Uh, thank you for the Harvard Bookstore. Thank you, Digilian, by his books, uh, all 12 of them. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you both, um, Julian and Rick, for your time. Uh, this was a fantastic conversation, and we are so lucky to have two experts engaging on such a vital and relevant topic with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, independent bookselling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. Um, if you'd like to support Julian and the bookstore, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase, Burning Down the House. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Have a great night. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.